There are very concrete habits that you can use, that I have used. Once you get your mind in the right place, once you believe that it can happen, this is what I did. I worked out. Why? Because it helped me gain control of my mind. One, it was micro credibility with myself every day. I said I was going to do something. I did it. Two, when you're suffering and you're willing to fight through it, you tell yourself a story that you're willing to pay the price to become what you want to become. And also, when you watch your body transform, you get the loudest signal from your subconscious that you can change, that you can change anything you want, that you can change your bicep, your tricep, your quad, whatever it is that you want. Something that you literally could not do the day before, you can do today. And your mind sees that that's true. Your mind sees that something you couldn't pick up yesterday, you can pick up today. And it begins to ask itself, well, if that's possible, then what else is possible? Now for me, finding my center was also a very important thing. So I work out first. The next thing I do without fail is meditate. I do a just breathe meditation where I'm simply trying to calm my mind. Then I do what I call thinkitating. During meditating, I get into an alpha wave state brain pattern, which enhances creativity and unique connections. I'm not worried about whether I'll ever think a unique thought. I am simply interested in the unique connections that I will make that no one else before me or after me will ever make. And that to me is what makes each of us a beautiful beautiful snowflake. I read, I read obsessively because I believe in one simple math equation, ideas in equal ideas out. And then I keep a list of the most important things I'm trying to accomplish. If you're trying to become something, you need to know what that something is. You are what you consistently do. The difference between where you are right now and where you want to be is what are you consistently doing every single day? Your habits will determine your ultimate success. One of the reasons why I've had so much success on YouTube is because I just keep making videos. It's a habit, it's burned into my calendar. <laughs> Every week I am making videos. I film, I'm here making this content for you guys now. I'm making more videos, more videos, more videos, more videos. It's consistently been a part of my routine for over a decade. If you do something, every single week or more frequent for a decade, you're gonna get some serious results. You'd have to be just absolutely terrible to not get any results if you are doing something every single week or more frequently for a decade. Most people don't wanna put in the work and I get it. And that can be frustrating, it can be slow, we want the instant results. And it's hard to shift the identity, your identity at the beginning because your habits of not doing something or your current habits that you are doing are stronger than the new habit that you're trying to build. So for me not to make a video would be so foreign, so weird. I've made videos through all sorts of crisis and, and tragedies and injuries. The only time when I didn't make videos was when my dog died. When my family dog died, it was on video day and I just couldn't bring myself to making the videos. So the only week where I like zero, I can't do it we have to do something else. But I've made videos through vacations. I've made videos through breaking my neck. I've made videos through everything, every tragedy that's happened, every negative, every, every stress, every frustration, I've found a way to make videos. It's so a part of me now, not because I'm superhuman or extra special, just because I put the reputation in. Now, a new habit that I'm trying to build is swimming. The pool just opened back up in my place and I've gone swimming every day for the past two weeks, week and a half. I've been going swimming and it's so, it's so fun, it's so freeing. I go for my swim. I started, I could only do 20 lengths of the pool. Now I'm up to 40 and I'm getting better at it. And I feel, I just feel so good. You, you swim, you have a shower and then like, oh, my body feels amazing right now. But it's still a new habit, right? I'm still trying to develop it. If I were to go and fly to a speaking gig and then come back, I would have to force myself to get back into, oh, right, swimming, swimming. That's what I'm supposed to do in the morning. I, I gotta go swimming, right, right, right. I'd have to set up reminders, I have to put it in my calendar. But making videos is so ingrained because it's lasted so long as I've done it. It feels super weird. If I, if I left YouTube or sold my channel or whatever, like, oh, what do I do now? I don't even know what to do anymore because making videos has become part of my identity. You too can change your identity you too can start to develop the habits that will help take you to accomplishing your goals. I wanna give three quick tips that I think will help you. Step number one is to get really clear on what the habit is that you wanna develop. Don't pick 20 different habits that you would wanna do all at once. This is where we, we struggle because we take on way too much, like, okay, that's it, I'm done. 
uh, I'm rolling up my sleeves. It's time to change my life. I've had it. I've had enough. I'm going to change everything. I'm going to work out and I'm going to I'm going to eat well and I'm going to make content. I'm going to grow my business. I'm going to find a girlfriend. I'm going to like whatever the thing is. You come with 20 different habits that you're going to do. And guess what? You do it tomorrow, maybe. And then and then it becomes too overwhelming, too much, too much change all at once. Your life just takes over and you end up back down in the hole where you started. Does that happen? Have you tried to take on too much at once? What is the single most important habit that you need to start to build? That if you look back in a year, you could say, I'm so happy that I built this one habit because it's helping you accomplish your goals. What is the most important habit? It could be waking up at a certain time. It could be taking care of your, your mind. It could be taking care of your body. It could be putting in a certain amount of work on your business. It could be writing your book. It could be making a hundred videos. Like what is the one habit that you want to start to build that if that one thing happened, your entire life starts to change. It's the cornerstone habit that you start doing that because I guarantee you, listen, if you start waking up at a certain time or you start working out, you can pick any of them. You start doing one of those things that you're proud of yourself for doing it. Other things start to change in your life around you. Because when you feel really proud of yourself, when you feel good about yourself, other things start to improve too. Because if you were, say your goal is to make 100 videos next year. Okay, so every three days you're making a video. And that's impossible, you've never done that and that sounds crazy and it's way too big. And then you start to do it. You start to actually build the momentum. You start to actually make the content. You say like, okay, well, what else, what else can I do? Uh, you know what, I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna start working on my health. It's just gonna happen naturally. You wanna find a relationship, people will gravitate towards you because now all of a sudden you're a lot more confident, a lot more proud. That's magnetic energy that people wanna be around. So you pick the one habit that you wanna stay consistent on and then you start doing that work, not being stressed out about having too many habits all at once and the whole thing fails. Okay, step number two, you have to schedule it. You have to put it in your calendar. Schedule it, it will not just happen. These videos are happening for me right now. It's in my schedule. I book time for. I have swimming in my schedule. That's, that's even more important in my calendar. So today at five o'clock, I'm gonna go swimming. It's in my calendar, I booked it. Because otherwise, other stuff could come in. Maybe I get on a roll on making videos or maybe somebody messages me and I have to deal with it. Something else will always come up. Something else will always come up, right? Stuff always comes up. And we let that be an excuse for you not to take action. You block it off, you put it in your calendar, show yourself when, right? Which day of the week are you actually gonna be doing this thing? Or which time of day are you actually gonna be doing this thing? And start to teach yourself that this gets done. That when you put less things in your calendar, right? Put less things in your calendar, make sure that they get done because you can put stuff in, you, how many times have you put stuff in your calendar and then it didn't get done, <laughs> right? Does that happen to you? Don't worry about that. Less things in your calendar, but when you put it in, it gets done. Again, this is building the identity. It's you starting to trust yourself that when you say something's gonna happen, that it happens and not just happens one off, but it happens consistently. So you, if you've got holidays coming up or vacation coming up, and your goal is still to do videos or swimming or write a, write a page for your book or whatever it is that is part of your goals. Plan your calendar. Show yourself what time. Okay, you know you're traveling tomorrow. Okay, are you gonna do it before you travel? You're gonna do it while you're on the plane? You're gonna do it when you land in the city? And what's realistic? Are you gonna be doing a 16 hour flight with two stopovers and then be exhausted when you land and that's when you're gonna do your workout? <laughs> Right? Like maybe work out in the morning. Like just think about your day that's coming ahead of you and schedule that thing in. Because again, when you can stay consistent on it, that's when everything starts to change. And then number three is get a community. Doing something difficult and doing something brand new is really, really, really hard to do by yourself. It's not impossible. It's not that you can't do it. But we are, we are community people. Like humans are, even, even me who's introverted and shy and I don't need a lot of friends, it's always more fun doing something with somebody. Knowing that tonight at five, Nina's going swimming with me, I'm more likely to show up because Nina's there too. It's gonna be a lot more fun because Nina's there too. Get somebody to be an accountability partner for you. Join a Discord group or a Facebook group that are talking about 
these things so that you don't feel like you're the only person going through this. Because when you have a down day, when you have a bad moment, when you're tired, when you had a rough sleep, when you got uh, terrible news, it's easy to fall right back down to the habits that you've been <laughs> consistently working on, the negative habits you've been building up over your lifetime instead of defaulting back to the positive ones that you want to start to build. The difference between where you are right now and where you want to be are the habits you consistently do. You are what you consistently do. You eat one chocolate bar, it's fine, as long as you're consistently eating really well. But if you eat really well only one day and you're eating chocolate bars every day, then guess what's gonna to happen to your health? You are what you consistently do and you can change it. You can change it. Where you are right now does not have to be where you are in one year if you put the habits in place, if you consistently schedule them in, and you get a community to help you so you're not doing this alone. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. You can't make a racehorse out of a pig, but you can make a really fast pig. Your life can be the answer to what does a fast pig look like? That is certainly what my life is. All the success that I've had in my life is not because I was gifted at any one thing. When I left for college, my mother quietly assumed I was going to fail. My best friend assumed I was going to marshmallow my way through life. When I asked my father-in-law for his blessing to marry his daughter, he said no. And yet I went on to be successful, to earn my father-in-law's respect, um, not because they misidentified me, because they didn't, they were right. But because I developed drive, I got the only belief that mattered. And I finally realized that humans are meant to grow and get better at something. And I just have to apply myself. And the same is true for you. Decide what you want to get good at and go after it with everything you've got. And that, my friends, is how you overcome negativity. As Henry Rollins said, I don't have talent. So I just get up earlier. The thing that people think about becoming great, about doing the extraordinary, is that it's just meant for some people and not meant for others. And they spend their time making other people extraordinary as a way to let themselves off the hook. Because if somebody is just gifted, if they were blessed by God, if they were touched by an angel, and they just have something that you don't and something that you never will have, then it's fine for them to be great and you to be ordinary. But the reality is it's not how it works. But somehow the cultural narrative has become one where we celebrate natural talent. That if somebody is graced by God, that if they have something divine about them, that they're somehow better, that it's more beautiful than the scrappy person who's had to work for everything they've ever had. The guy who simply acknowledges, like Henry Rollins, that he doesn't have more talent than the next person. He's simply willing to outwork them. He's willing to set the alarm, to get up, to do whatever it takes, to find his path, to create that skill, to outwork talent, to show that by putting in that energy and that effort, there's a magnification effect that is far greater than anything that can be given to you, bestowed upon you. you you have to grab it. You have to take it. You have to have a level of intensity in your life to be able to leverage it and create something amazing. And as Warren Buffett said, intensity is the price of excellence. If you want to be great, you've got to cultivate that intensity. You've got to understand it's not about what you were born with. It's not about what you were given, where you started, or even where you're going. It is entirely about what you plant at the center of your soul, how hard you're willing to go after something, how much focus you're willing to put in your life, and how often you come back to that level of intensity for who you want to be. Because if you want to be excellent, you will have to pay a price. And that price is eternal vigilance. 
vigilance over how you spend your time, vigilance over the demands you make of yourself, vigilance over what you allow yourself to think and believe. And when you get to the point that you only allow yourself to think and believe things and move you towards your goals, that every day the actions you take are things that are designed to get you there, and that you have the intensity to follow that through, to shape yourself, to create a new version of you capable of doing something extraordinary, then your life is going to be what you want. But not until then. It's never going to be anything if you just make other people extraordinary and say, I could never do that. But the reality is you could, and you're just not. So the thing that you have to face right now is that it is within your grasp. You just have to go after it. And let me tell you, passion is not something you were born with. It drives me nuts. Everybody thinks they're going to turn inside like an archaeologist and find that thing, their deepest passion, the thing they always loved, hiding inside. As, as soon as you say it, I hope it sounds ridiculous, that you would love something that much and yet somehow be blind to it? It doesn't work like that. It's like real love. You've got to go on a date first. You see somebody you're interested in. You talk to them. It sparks something. You spend time. You engage. And through that process of engaging with it, maybe if you're lucky, it turns into a fascination. But if you really want a passion, you've got to go through the process of gaining mastery. And mastery is the part of the relationship in business or in romance where everybody falls apart because it's where the work starts. It's where you have to do things long after it stopped being fun. Now the process of taking myself from scrounging in my couch cushions to find enough change to put gas in my car to building a billion dollar business was all about building a set of beliefs. Now I believe that the matrix has us all. I don't actually think we live in a simulation, but I think the movie The Matrix is the perfect metaphor for the human experience. We have all pulled a web of lies over our own eyes, and the web of lies is what you tell yourself about what's possible for you and for the world. And once you get that web of lies over your eyes, you simply see it as reality, and you don't understand that each one of those fundamental beliefs is alterable, that you could choose to believe something else. In fact, you don't even realize that they are beliefs. Einstein has a quote. It's one of the most important quotes in my life. The most important question any man must decide for himself is whether or not he lives in a friendly or hostile universe. Now what I love about that quote, so what's hiding in it, is that it's a decision. You get to choose whether you're living in a friendly or a hostile universe. There's no objective reality. It just is what it is. You're going to get what you see. You're going to get what you focus on. And you see what you focus on. So many people are obsessed with becoming perfect that they never take action. And they never learn to enjoy this moment. That may be one of the greatest tragedies any of us can face. That right now, whatever we are, however we are, however good we are, whatever we've accomplished, that we fail to enjoy this moment because we have a judgment about who we are deep down because we haven't acted in a way that's perfect. And I get it, we have this drive, it's innate in us, we want to be great. It's one of the five primary human drivers to pursue mastery, to want to master something and truly be extraordinary. I understand the drive. But don't let it corrode you. Don't ever do something that eats you alive from the inside. You've got to have a vision of yourself that allows you to morph and change and learn from your mistakes. But if you value perfection over learning, then you're never going to become the person that you'd be capable of becoming. And as Anna Quindlen said, the thing that is really hard and really amazing is giving up on being perfect and beginning the work of becoming yourself. Let me tell you something that is true beyond measure. The struggle is guaranteed. The success is not. The struggle is a guarantee. So you better love what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Read Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now. The only moment that's real is right now. Now follows you. 
So every time you're doing something, if you're standing and staring and waiting for someone to finish going to the restroom or whatever, you're standing in line at Disneyland, that is your life. That is the sum total of what you are about in that moment. And life is simply a string of those moments. And so you've got to start asking yourself, am I using those moments wisely? Everything around you is incredible if you're willing to look at it that way. Everything around you can be taken for granted if that's your perspective. But it really is about the frame that you choose to put around things. I mean, simply being alive is already insane. The odds are so stacked against you, not only just being a human, but being a human at this moment in time. This moment in time where breakthroughs in technology are happening at at an unprecedented rate, where breakthroughs in medical science are happening at an unprecedented rate, where our ability to connect with people, to empathize with people all the way around the globe, all of the changes that have happened in technology and telecom and connectivity, health, everything. We're living in the most miraculous time ever. But you have to look at it that way. And as Joseph Campbell said, life is a wonderful, wonderful opera, except that it hurts. So the question is, do you see it as the beautiful opera? Or do you just pay attention to the pain? And at the end of the day, you're gonna get what you focus on. They're both true. This is both the most amazing time that's ever happened ever in recorded history. And yet real things that are terrifying are also happening. But where you put your energy, where you put your attention, where you put your focus is going to determine what you see. And that is the most fascinating and the most important thing you have to understand about the way that your mind works. You get what you focus on. If you focus on the things that are bad, they will become real. They will become exaggerated. They will begin to monopolize your thoughts. You'll see them everywhere. It's called the reticular activating system. Your mind is literally designed to pay attention to the things that you notice. Once you notice a certain car, you see it everywhere. Once you notice a certain dog, you see it everywhere. Once you hear a certain name for the first time, suddenly you realize that that name has been all around you this entire time. But now that you're focusing on it, now that you're looking for it, it is everywhere. So whatever you look for, it's gonna be everywhere. If you look for the negative, it'll be there. But if you look for the positive, it will overwhelm you. And if you guys haven't read the book, Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb do. In that book, he lays out the difference between something that is resilient and something that is truly anti-fragile. I'm going to say somebody that's unstoppable is truly anti-fragile. And what anti-fragile is, the more you attack it, the stronger it gets. So something that is resilient or tough, it is still defined by its breaking point. The more you go after it, eventually it will break. Something that's anti-fragile grows with that. And I believe each and every one of us can build a mindset that is truly anti-fragile. But there is only one thing that I have found that is actually anti-fragile, and it looks like this. I was there with my partners. They routinely made me feel stupid all the time. They were older than me. They were more than 10 years ahead of me on their entrepreneurial journey. And so I was just wrong all the time. Now, up to that point in my life, I actually called myself the king of remedial jobs. Up until then, I'd only gone for jobs where I knew I'd be smarter than the person interviewing me. I knew that at some point during the interview, they were going to ask that magical question, which made me feel so good about myself, which was, why are you here? Why are you interviewing for this job? And I lived for that because it made me feel smart. So here I am. Now, not in that world anymore. I'm with guys who are way ahead of me. They're way smarter than me. And I feel dumb all the time. And one day I find myself arguing for this path in our business because it was my idea. And I knew it was wrong. That was a hilarious thing. I knew it was wrong, and yet I was arguing for it, like, really passionately. And then all of a sudden, it actually worked. And they agreed to do it. And I thought, oh, now what? <laughs> I've been telling my wife that I'm going to make her rich, and here I am arguing for something that just makes me feel good about myself. And I had this moment of crisis, and I asked myself, no judgment. What do you really want? Because if what you really want is to feel good about yourself, to feel smart, to be right, to be worthy, if those are the things that you want, then get out of this company, because you're wrong often. You're making mistakes all the time. And your partners 
are so far ahead of you that they make you feel stupid. So this is like, that doesn't make any sense. So if you want to just go feel good, go back to being the king of remedial jobs, be in places where you're always feeling smart, where you're usually right, and live that life. But if, on the other hand, what you really want is to actually reach your goals, then you're going to have to stop worrying about feeling good about yourself. And both of those felt flawed. Everybody needs to feel good about themselves. That, that's just the reality of being a human. You've got to find a way to feel good about yourself. But I really believe everything you do in life should be in service of your goals. And the moment that you're acting out of alignment with your goals, you either have a problem with your goal or with your behavior. One of them is going to have to change. And so I realized in that moment that I needed to change what I was building my self-esteem around because I was building it around being right and I was wrong so much. I was building it around being smart and I just wasn't that smart. I was building it around being good and worthy. And the fact is those were just judgments on myself. And so I decided right then and there, it's the one thing in my life that borders on truly being an epiphany. And I realized I need to change what I build my self-esteem around and it needs to be something that I didn't have the word anti-fragile at the time, but something that the more somebody goes after it, the better off I'm going to be. The more it's going to push me towards my goals. And that thing is, and if somebody has a better answer, I will take it. But the only way to build your ego that is truly anti-fragile that I have found is to be the learner. To be willing to admit when you're wrong. To look at your goal and work backwards and say, is what I'm doing actually moving me towards my goal or not? Not does it make me feel good about myself. Not am I right. Not am I smart. Is it moving me towards my goal? And if it is, then you do it. And if it doesn't, then you don't. And my life became that cut and dry. And you can literally draw a line in the sand, a demarcation point of my life before that and my life after that. As Kurt Vonnegut, one of the greatest authors in modern times said, when I write, I feel like an armless, legless man with a crayon in his mouth. But he still did it. And that's the kind of thing that you're going to hear from the greats. You're not going to hear that it was easy. You're not going to hear that they felt suave and cool. Even the greatest of all time have that awkwardness and that clumsiness. They're never quite as good as they want to be. But what I want you to understand is even though Kurt Vonnegut said those words, he wrote tons of books that changed people's lives, that changed the landscape of literature because despite the fact that he felt awkward and clumsy, he kept doing it and doing it and forcing himself to move forward, to take one step after another even when the process was not exactly rewarding. He believed in something. He knew that what he was trying to do would ultimately get better. He knew that if he wanted to accomplish something great, that he had to push through the awkwardness. And that is the very trick to getting great. You just have to do it. You have to go. You have to take that first step. You have to push. You have to drive. You have to strive every time to get a little bit better. You have to strive not to fall prey to your own doubts and insecurities. And as Joe Namath said, if you aren't going all the way, why go at all? Whatever your skill set is now, whatever your vision of yourself is now, you can change it. You can become anything you want to be. But life is going to ask you one simple question. What price are you willing to pay to get there? And that's it. That's the hard truth. If you're willing to pay the price, then you can become whatever you want. You can become truly capable of the extraordinary. But you've got to go through the process of building that skill set. You've got to be willing to stare nakedly at your inadequacies to understand that you aren't yet the person that you want to be or need to be to execute against your goals, but that you can become that person and then start walking down that path. And day by day, brick by brick, build the skill set that you want. As Harun Yeya noted, I always wonder why birds stay in the same place when they can fly anywhere on earth. And then I ask myself the same question. As Mark Twain put it, the secret of getting ahead is getting started. 
And that's where people get stuck. You're literally like the bird. You could fly anywhere you want. You can go anywhere you want to go. And look, I know you've got a litany of excuses and all of them are valid. You've got a job you can't just leave or you don't have a job and you don't have the money. Holding you back and making you a less version of yourself. So I ask you, why doesn't the bird fly wherever it wants to go? Because that's all it's known? Because that's what's safe? Because that's what's comfortable? Or because it's a dumb animal? What do you want to be? If this isn't the life you want to live, do something about it. Humans lead with belief. That may be the single most important thing to understand. Humans lead with belief, meaning you don't do something and then believe you can do it. You won't even take the first step if you don't believe that your actions will be rewarded with results. That's why so many people are paralyzed because they think that they're not worthy, they think they're, or they know they're uneducated. They know that they're not the person that they need to be in order to accomplish. And the reality is you're probably not. The fact is your skill set has already taken you as far as it's going to take you. So if you are unsatisfied with where you are today, I have some horrifying news for you. I'll chase it with some good news. But first, let's start with the bad. The bad news is your life is an exact reflection of the choices you've made. That's it. It's not circumstance. It comes down to skill set and choices. You've chosen to build a certain skill set. You've chosen to do certain things, take certain risks, play certain things safely. Whatever the case may be, those were all choices. Now your life is a reflection of that. What I want you to understand though, the belief, the only belief that you need to have, that thing that is going to allow you to take that first step is not to believe that you're capable of what you're trying to build because we all know you're not. I knew that I wasn't when we started Quest. I knew I wasn't the person that I needed to be. I understood that. It just didn't paralyze me because I believed one thing. And if you take nothing else from what I say today, burn the following statement into your soul. Humans are the ultimate adaptation machine. That's it. Charles Darwin is often misquoted as saying, that it's the strongest of the species that survive. He'd never said that. What he actually said was, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but rather the most adaptive to change. We're the apex predator for a reason, because unlike any other animal, we have the ability to go in any direction, any direction we want. We're the only species that you can find anywhere. At one point, James Cameron was actually at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. We can thrive anywhere, from Inuits living in the tundra to peoples that have survived in the desert, because humans adapt. That is the fundamental nature of what we are. So then these two successful entrepreneurs walk into my class. And up to that point, I'd promised myself two things. So I grew up chubby in a morbidly obese family and with no money. And I said, one day I'm gonna be rich and one day I'm gonna have six pack abs. Hmm. And 
that was my promise. And these guys walked in and they were rich and they had six pack abs. <laughs> and they said, look, we're starting a technology company. Why don't you come be a copywriter? And I was like, absolutely. And it's one of those where people are like, what are you doing? Like you're yeah. leaving the secure job. For me, I was like, they're like unicorns to me. Yeah. They are literally the thing I'm looking for. Yeah. They are rich and they have six pack abs and they're gonna let me into their company. Yeah. And so their whole pitch was, look man, this is a startup. You can have any job in this company you want. You just have to become the right person for the job. Mm. So it was a tech company. It was in this beautiful office overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Every single person in that company had a floor to ceiling window nice. overlooking the Pacific Ocean, nice. except me. And they put me in the server room, which had no windows and a bunch of computers, all worrying and making noise. And I remember one of the guys was like, who's the kid in the server room? And so that's how I became known. I was the kid in the server room. I didn't know anything about business. I would bring my wife Jeez, to please. visit me in the office and I'm like, look how beautiful the office is and this is where I'm at. <laughs> you know, and like literally like those makeshift desks that are like yeah. really like a table that you would use on a picnic, yeah. but you've got a computer stacked on it. Yeah. That's where I worked all day. Do you believe big time that identity is shaped by these associations in everybody's life? 100%. Talk about that for a second. So it's so aggressive and it's now getting repeated. So I fear trite words, mm -hmm. but words become trite because they're so true that people repeat them until they lose their meaning. Mm -hmm. So you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. That's just true. Mm -hmm. And But now it's become so common to say, and it's like every Instagram post, that I, I fear it's gonna lose its meaning. Who are you spending time with? Mm -hmm. Because if you're spending time with people like you, you're spending mm -hmm. time with people like me, I'm, I'm raising you up or I'm just not gonna spend time with you. Mm -hmm. So it's like now, if you get in a mix of people like that who are like, man, we'd love for you to raise up to this level. But if you don't, it's fine, but we're just not gonna spend time with you. All of a sudden that desire to belong to something powerful that you can see is gonna lead you to your dreams. And I remember saying to my wife over and over and over, they are the surest path to my success. Wow. I don't know anything else. I just know if I can hang on to these guys, they're gonna make me better. Literally, the first time I wrote this whole article, it was my first blog article, and it was all about how if I were hit by a drunk driver, I would take ownership of that. I would say that is my fault. And people were pissed. And I was so shocked. I literally thought, I want to pull people from the matrix. What's the one gift that I could give people that will change their life forever? And I wrote this whole thing, and I was like talking about like, oh man, you're in this spot and it ends up being a kill box and there's cars on either side of you and a car in front of you and your horn dies and you can't even start your car and move. You look in the rearview mirror and this drunk driver's plowing down, they smash into you and it's all your fault. And thank God, because now you remember that you're in control. But people thought I was victim shaming. People were outraged that I would say that that was anyone's fault but the drunk driver. But I don't want to do that because I choose not to ever be a victim. I cannot choose whether I'm victimized, but I have the ability to say I will never be a victim because there's always something you can do differently. There is always something you can do differently. And once you understand that you can always make a different choice and get a different reaction, and that's the power in your life, that's the power that you have, is no matter what's going on, you can choose to think differently, believe differently, see differently. All of those things are a choice. Read Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Lost his whole family to the Holocaust. Was in, I think, five different concentration camps. And he said the thing that people die of in a concentration camp is the loss of a why. And Nietzsche said, if you have a why, you can survive almost any how. Because you can always change how you think about something. And when you change how you think about it, it's what we've been talking about all day. When you change how you think about it, you actually change the event. Here's the problem I find most people have. They judge themselves through the lens of a moment. They fail at something. They miss the honor club. They don't close that deal they thought they were going to. They embarrass themselves. They flub something. And they think that defines who they are. But I'm telling you right now, you're not defined by who you are. You're defined by who you want to become and the price you're willing to pay to get there. Here's the hard truth about getting great. It takes time and dedication. 
It takes a willingness to accept that you're not yet good enough. It takes the ability to stare at the places that you know that you're weak, to really look at those things and not let it affect your sense of self-esteem and not let it affect your sense of self their skill set to relentlessly look at the things that they're not doing well, to understand that they have to break themselves down and get rid of all of their ego before they can really find greatness. Those are the people that we remember. Wing. Take another photo. Try another task. Do something that scares you and do those little things over and over and over until you win. So the one thing I will say is I was grandly ambitious. I always said, I'm going to be rich. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Always, always since the time I was a little kid, but I didn't have the drive to see it through. So I really, really was an empty dreamer when I was a kid and oh. it was learning to hate that in myself, if I'm completely honest. Yes and to not allow myself to be an empty dreamer, to force myself to get the skills to actually execute against it, to not be in any way, shape, or form pacified by saying I'm gonna do something, which is actually super dangerous. Most people just thinking about the fantasy of what they're gonna do gives them some partial sense of, oh, I've done it. Hmm. Whereas I stopped letting that be okay for me, which largely came down to embarrassment I felt around my wife working when I had no job. And that was the time, she was my fiance at the time, yeah. but that was when I really started to go, okay, you've made a lot of promises to this woman and you're not on a path to keep any of them. Tom, am I going to make it? Do I have what it takes? When you look into my future, can you see me making it? And I'm going to cut to the chase for all of you, and you're going to mistake what I'm about to say for good news. And then I'm going to tell you why it's actually the worst thing I could tell you. You all meet minimum requirements. You all meet minimum requirements. So whatever it is you want to do, I'm not going to say that it's going to be easy for you because you're ultra smart or something. You probably aren't. But everyone that I've encountered here, literally, without exception, every single person that has come up to me and said something, you meet minimum requirements. Even you awkward.
that have a hard time like making eye contact. Even you guys, I'm telling you right now, you've got some shit you're gonna have to deal with, but you meet minimum requirements. Now minimum requirements for what? For whatever you want. Now that sounds great, right? Oh shit. Tom said I can make it. This is amazing. But all I've actually said is now, if you don't make it, it's on you. And that's it. There's nobody else to blame. Everything is your fault. Everything. Once you understand, the whole reason to acquire a skill is that it gives you power. Now I'm gonna define power. Power to me is the ability to close your eyes and imagine a world, the world the way you wish it was, and then open your eyes and make that world come true. That's power. And the thing that stands between you, where you are today, and your goals, where you wanna get, is a gap in skill set. It is a gap in abilities. And once you're willing to look nakedly at your inadequacies, to literally build your self-esteem, your entire sense of self-worth and value is built around one thing. Whenever you face an obstacle, whenever you face a difficulty, whenever you fail, you have one thing that you say to yourself. On a long enough timeline, I can learn this. When you switch your life around to that, whatever your goal is here, whatever part of the honors club or the leading edge you're at, or if you wanna go beyond that, whatever that is, wherever you wanna go, plant that flag, identify the skills that you would need to get there, and then set about every day getting those skills. People get the do part. They understand their actions should be actions that take them towards what they want to accomplish. But people often miss the most important part, which is only to believe things that move you towards your goals. And I see people every day that tell themselves a story about themselves that they are worthless, that they're meaningless, that they're pointless, that their friends and family would be better off if they just died. So we have to find a way to construct a narrative about ourselves that empowers us, that lifts us up, even though, even though we make mistakes, even though we fall down, even though we're never going to get things right all the time, and even though terrible things happen to us, or maybe we do terrible things. But in that, the erosion of the self that's the danger. The erosion of the self, that is the danger. And when I talk to people about the 80-20 principle, 80% 80 of the time you should be focused on the things that you love, the beautiful things that you wanna to bring to this world, the beautiful things that are already in the world. And 20% of the time you should be kicking yourself in your ass and saying you can do better. It's such a powerful idea. But the problem is when people get to the 20%, they forget that it's only supposed to be 20% of the time and that it's meant to be these acute moments where you're pushing yourself to be more, to do more. It isn't so you can tear yourself down. That's why you have to do and believe that which moves you towards your goals. And if thinking that you're a worthless piece of shit moves you to your goals somehow, then fine, do it. But I can't literally fathom a universe in which that would be a logical way to move forward. So I'm gonna give you the magic words that you need right now to never fall prey to that. Believing I'm worthless does not serve me and I don't do things that don't serve me. Repeat that in your head every time you begin to disparage yourself. Here's the harsh reality. You're just not good enough yet. As Brian Tracy said, your true success in life begins only when you make the commitment to become excellent at what you do. This is the gap that I see in most people's lives. They've not yet made the commitment to become extraordinary. And the reason that they haven't made that commitment yet is they don't believe that they can. They're afraid of what it might take to get there. They just don't want it enough. That's the reality. 
Most people don't want it enough to face all of that. They don't want to face their inadequacies. They don't want to accept that they're going to have to go through that process, that gut-wrenching, back-breaking process of becoming great. And every day lulls them into this sense that there's always time to do it tomorrow. But the reality is there is only now. There is only today. And if you really want to do something with your life that leaves your own jaw on the floor, that leaves you in awe of what you've done, you're going to have to admit you're not yet good enough. You've got to put in that work, that you've got to develop a set of skills that simply can't be denied. But if you do that on the other side of getting that good at falling in love with something and working so hard that you can feel yourself changing as a human being on the other side of that, is something unimaginably beautiful. And as Les Brown said, if you set goals and go after them with all the determination you can muster, your gifts will take you places that will amaze you. That's what I want in my life, and I hope that's what you want in yours, is to be amazed. To be amazed at how extraordinary this life really is. This opportunity to make of yourself anything you want to be. Really think about that for a second. You can become anything you want to become. You can become an astronaut, a world-class athlete, a musician, the best parent that this world has ever seen. Anything you want is yours for the taking. But it takes effort. It takes a willingness to stare nakedly at your inadequacies. It takes a willingness to really gut check yourself about where you are today. And it doesn't mean that you can't go and be something better tomorrow. And falling in love with that process, that knowing that being a human and really getting the most out of your potential is that. To know that tomorrow I can be better than I am today and that doesn't make you a bad person today. It's okay to know that you can be better tomorrow and still love yourself today. But it's also okay to love yourself today and demand that you get better tomorrow. And once you can do that, there is literally nowhere you can't go. So I would get kicked in the face and I would do something really dumb. I'd be called an idiot, told how stupid I was. And then I'd just be like, all right, I need to recenter. And that just became my obsession. I need to be able to emotionally get back to complete neutral so fast that you don't even see it register on my face. How'd you do it? How do you do that? literally practice. So I could get, I could be in a situation where I'm being berated or, or I legitimately mess up and it costs money and it's like, whoa, that's on me and it is nobody's bad but my own. And I realized that what most people do, their strategy is to deflect it. It's your fault, it's not my fault. Yes. So I started thinking of this as a metaphor. People are throwing gold at me. They're throwing it really hard mm -hmm. and I can put a shield up and deflect it, but mm -hmm. then I lose that piece of gold. Mm -hmm. If I drop my shield and just take the pain, let it hit me in the head, then I bend down and go, this thing, which was me being stupid, there's a lesson here. Ooh. And now I have this piece of gold. Ooh, ooh, ooh. But the whole thing is I have to be defenseless. Mm -hmm. So I have to own it, I have to take it, I can't fight. If someone is like, this to this day, if our team is like, hey, there's something we need to point out to you, I'll do this. I square up to it, mm -hmm. I want them to know, like, hey, I wanna hear it, mm -hmm. I wanna know. Like, I wanna be literally physically open, I'm not gonna close down, I'm gonna do everything I can to square off, to open mm -hmm. myself so that they know I'm receptive oh, to bro. the criticism, right? Because that's the nugget of gold. What I know is it's gonna hurt, it's gonna sting. Yep. But if I can emotionally recenter so fast you don't even see that I went through something, now I can just process how do I take this information you've given me and get better. I went through the pain of living the cliche of money can't buy happiness early. So that was the very thing that gave birth to my true financial success. Was so me walk saying, me through that though. So that, most people will never experience what it's like to come into crazy wealth. Yeah, it, it, is, it is a really funny moment and funny is the right word. Um, it's, it's fun, but it's also funny in that when I was growing up, part of the reason I wanted to get rich was I looked at those people with admiration and I did not look at myself with admiration. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, well if I can get wealthy then I will look at myself with admiration, this would be amazing. And then when I got the money, by then I had changed myself fundamentally as a person and I had earned so much self-respect and so much self-worth that by the time I got the money I, didn't, I wasn't looking for anything from the money other than it is the great facilitator. It will let you do extraordinary things. But it won't make you an extraordinary person, it won't make you feel any differently about yourself. And because the money came literally like that, because we had paper wealth, so I was a, worth hundreds of millions of dollars on paper. But I just cannot stress enough, 
that's meaningless in your real life. I uh-huh. was driving, you know, at one point a beat up Ford Focus. My wife and I had to share it, had a leaky exhaust, and yet I'm worth, at that point, I was worth tens of millions of dollars. But there were employees that were living far better lives than I was from a financial standpoint. So that's paper money. Now, bank account money came in an instant. And so it was about, I don't know, six years into our journey. And we um, decided to take a small investment to diversify. So it was a pure founder liquidity moment. And because the valuation of the company was over a billion dollars, you can imagine even at a small percentage, just the raw number of dollars is insanity. Uh So all of a sudden I was fantastically wealthy, but I was like, it is so, in fact, this, this was how that day went. So Everyone I said earlier, you beliefs, values, identity, habits, routines, right? These are the things that make people up. And I just have a value system that says it's not about the money. It's about building something you believe in. It's about serving other people. It's about work ethic. It's about showing up and working. And I value myself for that. So on the day that the money hit, it hit at like, I don't know, 8 a.m. in the morning or something. And my wife, we're both in the gym. And she's like, what are we going to do today? And I was like, what do you mean? I'm going to work. And she like couldn't wrap her head around that. Uh-huh. She's like, whoa, whoa. You're not going to go to the Lamborghini dealer? Yeah, she's something. like, come on. We've got to like go do something. We've uh-huh. got to celebrate. And I'm like, there's no universe in which I don't show up for work today. None. Under no circumstances. So if you were to ask my employees, when did the money hit? They'd all be like, I have no idea. They knew that it did hit, but they didn't know what day because I acted completely the same. And the thing that I want people to understand is I feel the same. So all of the like things that I believe about myself to be good, I still believe to be good. I earned them. I earned them by doing the hard thing time and time and time and time again. I know how much I'm willing to serve people and my family and myself and all. I just know I've done it for years and years and years. So when it came to do I buy an island and retire or do I double down, it came down to what will make me love my life the most. And the reality is the thing that would make me love my life the most, because it would still be fun to just go home and be with my wife. But the thing that will make me love my life the most is to do the things that are fulfilling. And I think fulfillment has a very specific universal formula. And that formula is work your ass off to get very good at something that you care deeply about that allows you to serve not only yourself, but other people. That's it. And for me, it was, I grew up in a morbidly obese family. My uncle essentially ate himself to death when I was 12 years old, and it was scary and sad. Mm. My mom is morbidly obese, has been my entire life. My Mm. sister's morbidly obese, has been almost her entire life. Um, My dad at one point was morbidly obese and then lost weight, but it was like, that's just where my family lived. And so I was like, they're going to die far sooner than they need to. And there's this great Mother Teresa quote, nobody will act for the many, but people will act for the one. And so I just needed to wake up every day and think about my mom and my sister, and that was it. And I thought, I can show up every day and fight for them. It's not about the money anymore. Here's, this may be the biggest problem we face as a society. People don't remember that skills have utility. They let you do something. You don't learn to build a house to impress your parents. You learn to build a house so people can live in the house you build. And once people understand that, like, holy You're building this house so somebody can live in it, build a home in it, have a family, be sheltered from storms. Like, it's a real thing, man. And so all of that effort and energy you went into, I have the chills right now, is so you can create that moment for yourself, for other people. It is is something so much more than going to architecture school, which maybe you went to because your parents wanted that and they, they were architects. And so you do that thing for that and you forget that the whole reason you became an architect was to build houses. And so once people realize, oh, I'm putting all of this time and energy to build these things because they let me do something. What do I want to do? What do I want to give? What do I want to create? When you look at skills from that perspective, it it is like, it is being a superhero. It is being a superhero. You're going to collect these abilities. These abilities actually let you do something. The fact that Superman can fly allows him to save people, allows him to do things other people can't do. We all have this opportunity to become capable of the extraordinary, to be able to do things other people can't do. And that feels so good. If you want another amazing Tom Bilyeu video, check it out right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there.